Before we start this show, just a word from our sponsor. 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest that pro wrestling has had to offer. Along with their awesome line of pro wrestling apparel, they do offer many services. In the world of wrestling, there are hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads. Don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20 by 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. If you would like to discuss possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or whatever, drop them a line. Go to 20 by 20 apparel. That's the number 20 X, the number 20 apparel.com. Now let's get to the show. Fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suckers bummy, me, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell the water though. You see me shining like a suit on puffy. You know my grindin' shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kicks, you can't cop it the mall. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 God damn it, we fresh. Welcome to the Fresh of the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Fraser. On Fresh of the Word, we deliver wisdom through great stories from the minds of bright creatives of pop culture. Through those stories, we like to dissect the journey of our guest and present actionable lessons and advice for our listeners, no matter what career or avenue of artistry they pursue. And this is episode 111. And this episode's guest is the Toronto-born, now New York-based hip-hop producer, Marco Polo. That move from Toronto to New York is the basis of Marco Polo's new collaborative album with hip-hop legend Masta Ace, who is back on episode 100 titled A Brooklyn Story, available now on all formats. Marco Polo has worked with a who's who of hip-hop throughout his time in New York, and during our chat we talked about his upbringing in Toronto, making the move to New York, his parents' support, his creative process, his hip-hop influences, lessons learned during his first few years in New York, working with Master Ace, working with all the big names artists he's worked with, and much, much more. Before we get into the interview with Marco Polo, I definitely want to give a shout out to Knox Money, Bang Belushi, and Foul Mouth for the theme music for Fresh of the Word. And also I want to remind you how you can support the podcast. You can always go to freshofthepodcast.com and share any of the links that you see on the website of any of the episodes on your social media platforms. You can also subscribe to Fresh of the Word at Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Stitcher Radio, Mixcloud, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Podbean, and Radio Public. Basically everywhere that podcasts are distributed to. And if you have any uh, questions for me, you can always email me at djkfresh at gmail.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kelly Omega Fresh and at Facebook at facebook.com slash kfresh. And you can also follow Fresh of the Word online on Twitter at FITW Podcast, on Instagram at Fresh of the Word Podcast, and at Facebook at facebook.com slash Fresh of the Podcast. All right, let's get on to the interview with Marco Polo. Yeah, recently I had Master Ace on the podcast. Um, but this was uh, just before you guys finished the album. You guys were just like on the home stretch, so we didn't really get the chance to talk about the album. So I'm glad that I was able to talk with you because we could talk about this really dope album that you guys put out. Dope. Thank you, man. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. You know, 
probably you feel the same way and like master ace is you know one of my favorite mcs of all time and like this album is just so good and like he always, and all of his albums are stories they're like a book and each song is like a chapter i agree <clears throat> he's one of the most underrated mcs in hip-hop history his ability to paint pictures on songs is very vivid and it's always I just feel like he has this simple way without being simple to just reach people's emotions without sounding corny to like, you know, but he does, you know, like when I listen to disposable arts, you know, <clears throat> all the stuff he was going through, he just communicated it so perfectly. And you're like, damn, like you felt his pain and, and some of the things, you know, on no regrets or, um, dear diary. Like he's just, I've always wanted to, have the opportunity to work with him on a whole project. So it's like a dream come true for me. Yeah, this new album, Brooklyn, is basically almost like a love letter to Brooklyn. And it's like your story moving to uh, Brooklyn uh, from Toronto. And then his story is kind of interwoven. Uh, but before we get into like this time frame that gets covered on this album, let's talk about before you moved to uh to new york you know what was your life like when you were still in toronto what were you doing what were you doing musically um <clears throat> i was musically before i moved to new york i would say i was still practicing and learning how to really make beats they weren't quite ready for the world to hear they weren't ready to be sent to mcs um I was going to engineering school, so I was learning a lot about how to use shit in the studio and equipment, and I was making a lot of early connections with people that would end up being a part of my crew and my music-making process for life, like Shiloh, who I met at Harris, who's been the executive producer of all my albums and in my production crew, and just, you know, incredible producer, MC, DJ, so... It was kind of like the, the, the blueprint was being laid down before we even knew what we were capable of doing. And, you know, then I moved to New York and everything started happening. You know, what sort, what sort of a kid were you growing up? Uh, probably a little shit for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in, you know, in Toronto area, the suburbs, um, to an Italian family uh, and in my house, music was very important between my parents. Uh, my dad had a more eclectic taste, I would say. That was a big influence on me early on. Um, but yeah, I was just a regular kid. I definitely got into some shit and, and really young and problems with drugs and alcohol and had to sort out a bunch of life shit at a young age yeah. and, and, you know, straightened it out and... Um, Got back on track, graduated high school, but, you know, I discovered uh, hip-hop really in the middle of high school is, you know, I kind of came into it late. It's not like I grew up listening to it when I was super young, you know, when I was in high school is when I really locked in and realized that I loved, you know, beats and, and, and fell in love with hip-hop for the first time. What sort of preparation uh, did you did you make to make this jump to move into New York, or did you, did you just jump in full force uh there was definitely some key people that helped me make that move um there wasn't a lot of planning uh specifically my boy lou who's on the album on a skit where he's like he kicks me out of the house because yeah. <laughs> you know his mom mitzi shouts to mitzi wanted me to leave um but yeah i met lou we were just both fans of hip-hop and when I wanted to make the move to New York to become a producer and intern at a studio, you know, I, I just really gave resumes to a studio, but he offered his basement. He's like, yo, you could come stay in the basement here at my mom's crib while you figure it out. And, you know, you, you could pay, I don't think I paid anything or, you know, I mean, I help with groceries, but it was, it was very, it was a key factor in me being able to make the move. Besides that, I didn't really have a plan other than get an internship and start, making connection and hustling and giving one of my beats and learning about, you know, the music scene. On, on the album, I really love the, the mom and the dad skits on there. Um, what, you know, what sort of, you know, extending on what those skits, you know, were about, you know, what's, what was your, uh, your parents' reaction when you started doing music and then you wanted to 
make this uh, this jump to New York. You know what? You know how did they help you make that move? They were both extremely supportive. I think my mother is definitely the more open-minded hippie vibes of the two parents. My father definitely supported me, but I know he might never say it to me, but he definitely had a little bit of fear that I was chasing something that was very risky. Yeah. Um, in his mind, he probably was hoping I would take a safer path, like, you know, go to university and become a accountant or a lawyer <laughs> or, or do something like that. But in no ways did he get in the way. He still supported my vision. And now he's absolutely, you know, proud of me and ecstatic and, and understands it and gets it. Um, but my mom definitely was was an interesting part because she initially let me like three, like thirty five hundred dollars when I moved to New York to buy my first computer and Pro Tools setup and basically my first little studio that I was able to record Port Authority on. Yeah. And she didn't even ask anything. I was like, this is what I need. And, you know, I was able to pay her back within like six months. And, you know, so I have the best parents is, is basically the answer to that question. <laughs> what was it? What was the reaction when you were able to pay her back? I think she was ecstatic, you know. <laughs> You know, um, maybe she thought in her mind they would never get paid back, but she just did it because I'm her son and, and she's like super dope, you know. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure she was happy. You know, I was able to pay off my student loan. I was able to pay off, her, you know, that. And it's a great feeling. Um, but, yeah, I think everybody involved in the situation, my family, my, including myself, we all had a lot of like, what the hell is he doing? Like, <laughs> here. But I was just so hyped, like. Mike's my motivation and my desire to go and do this like overshadowed any fears I had of you know, you're just gonna leave um you know you're just gonna go to New York blindly without really a plan or you know so I didn't care I was just like I'm doing it was there anything that you learned during your upbringing something that was instilled in you that was able to help you make this transition to New York and sort of have the success in music um, honestly, this is going to sound fucked up, but I think I just have an addictive personality. And when <laughs> I stopped doing drugs, uh, I replaced that, that, um, you know, infatuation to do something over and over again with music. And I really believe that th that part of my personality, which is in my family, we have addicts in my family <laughs> without getting into details. <laughs> But I do think in a crazy way that passion or being so focused on something, you know, and more than anything, helped me succeed in music. Um, you know, so I, I replaced music and I just did it all the time, like literally sacrificed, left my girlfriend back in Toronto, like my family. Like I was just like, fuck everybody. Like, this is what I want to do. I'm putting everything into it. Every minute, every second, I will do this. Like, so... How do you balance that addictive personality with your creativity? Oh, uh, good question. Um, I don't know. Sometimes it's tough because every day I get up and go to the studio, like it's so routine and, and I'm good at being disciplined because I work for myself, but sometimes it's not there, you know, like, and it is tough because Sometimes I should not be in the studio. I should do other shit. I should go take a walk. I should see my friends. I should, you know, maybe socialize with humans in, in the outer <laughs> world of my apartment. And I'm like, no, got to make beats. And <laughs> I'm learning over time that you can't force the shit. Like, you know, and that's one of the things I think social media is there's a negative to is that if you go on there, it's like you see people doing all these things or I'll watch a producer like knots who's making like 13 beats a day. And I'm like, okay, I definitely got to go to the studio and work. I'm slack, but <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I have a good gauge of my own energy and myself and his path is different from my path and how we create and how we work is different. Uh, I am totally comfortable to make one beat, you know, every couple days or a beat a day, or it's just going to happen how I make it. Because for me, uh, it's more about making some special, than you know me stressing myself out to make quantity you know every week like and i really think that that's evident with the project that me and ace make you know maybe i don't have 30 albums 
a year out, but I wanted to make it count when I do put out that one. And I'm seeing the vibes of, of and reactions to a Brooklyn story. And I'm like, yo, man, you know, like we, we me and him to go with this one. You know, it's going to resonate with people for a while. When you when you what do you do when you force yourself to sort of get away from making beats and sort of take that time to sort of recharge your batteries? What do you do? I go to the gym, believe it or not, even though I'm a skinny ginger bastard. I've, <laughs> I've made an effort in the last two years to uh, counteract my chain smoking with, with at least healthy eating and going to the gym at least three times a week. Uh, um, I'm kind of a hermit. Like, I really have a small circle of friends in New York. Like, I have a lot of people I know, but it's different from, you know, people I want to spend time with and hang out with. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my closest friends, Skiz, is here. He's part of my production crew and one of my best friends. And we definitely hang out and go grab food and just regular shit, go, go digging, you know, or I'll go to his place, listen to what he's working on. But it's definitely good to just stop making music and go live your life. And, and I feel like that'll help you, like, refill the creative tank with just experiencing, you know, simple shit. You said in high school that you that's when you started listening to hip hop. What was the stuff that you were into? You know, what really you know, what what really made you catch the bug and want to start making music? Um I mean, there was I remember the first four CDs I ever bought um and they were Built for Cuban Links by Raekwon, Dos yeah. Effects Hold It Down, Cypress Hill Temples of Boom and Jizza Liquid Swords. Uh, before that, I was definitely listening to hip hop. My dad bought Tribe's first album because he liked Bonita Applebaum, so that was, <laughs> which is so fucking random to this day. Um, but God bless him. <laughs> and then I remember having a CD called Rap Tracks Volume Two, which was like a compilation. It had Slick Rick, Children's Story, Yellow Cool Jam, that type of guy, De La Soul. I remember Saint those. Soul. You know, then a Cherry Buffalo Stance, um, and. So and then there was there was stuff on the radio locally in Toronto, like all the legendary Canadian artists like Maestro Fresh West and, you know, obviously Chocolair, Socrates, Cardinal, like yeah. a lot of Frankenstein. So <clears throat> these are all part of the early introductions I had, but really the RZA and then getting into Gangstar and just is the it was the beats, man. Like obviously I I love the rhymes and stuff, but Prince Paul, Gravedigger's album, like Ooh, yeah. You're just hearing these break beats and samples and soulful, dirty, you know, it's just it just put me in another place. You know, I'm in the suburbs of, you know, in a, in a city called Richmond Hill, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto. But like listening to this shit, and that's when I was still probably smoking weed. Like it just it put me in another universe that I thought was much cooler than the universe I was in. And and, um, you know, getting getting a glimpse of 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 basically the hood and the ghetto and the streets of New York. Cause you know, East coast stuff is really what I, I loved uh, when I first came up. So I don't, now I'm just babbling. I don't know if that answered your question, but oh, yeah, totally did. <laughs> um, so after you, uh, make the move to New York, um, definitely had some like sound engineering jobs. Like what, what was some of the things that you were doing outside of just the work that you were doing? Oh, I mean, at the cutting room, that was the studio that finally gave me an internship and shouts to my boy Lou and Ayatollah, the legendary producer that helped me find the cutting room. Uh, they were right beside Raucous Records. So I walked into this studio, not even, it wasn't even on my list of studios to give a resume to. My boy Ayatollah, who I met through Lou, was working on a bunch of qual Talib Kweli and most deaf shit in this studio that Ruckus was renting out. And I was like, what studio is this? this is dope. And the manager was right there. I gave him my resume. And they were like, yeah, you, I got, you know, you can start interning right away. So basically what I was doing is a lot of bitch shit for the first three months. I was getting coffee. <laughs> I was cleaning bathrooms. I was fucking going on sandwich runs. You know, I was doing whatever I had to do because interns, that, that you're the bottom of the chain. So you do whatever you're told to do to, you know, make the customers and the clients happy. And then I thankfully got hired to start assisting engineering and then managing the studio. So it was... It was a bit cooler, and then I started getting in the rooms and watching some of the artists record. Like I, I was in the studio with De La Soul when they were re recording the Grind Date. Okay, and sweet. Amazing sessions. I was in the studio with Quali while he was doing his quality, his, yeah, quality album. You know, I was around Most Def when he was working on his second solo album. Uh, Inspected Deck on his second album. Like I saw a lot of dope shit and was 
slowly starting to you know get involved and in, in engineer and record stuff and you know even even artists like a marie like i was yeah. working on sessions with her right when she blew up and being around um chucky thompson and, and a lot of interesting producers not necessarily hip-hop so that studio was everything for me in the beginning and that's how i met master ace that's how i met you know it was really the the starting point during that time when you were doing the internships doing the engineering what what was some of the things that you learned during that time that you didn't know beforehand um i learned i definitely didn't want to be an engineer i was just <laughs> I was just there to to make connects and and learn about you know how things work, but I definitely just wanted to make beats and work on my music. I learned quickly. I do not have a passion for you know unless it's super dope. Like engineering was not my thing. I also learned that sometimes it's good to not meet some of your favorite artists because they turn out to disappoint you and not be the person that you had hoped listening to them. You know, and then right. on the flip side, I met artists that I loved that exceeded my expectations when I met them. And I was like, you're even fucking cooler now. So um, that reality is a little harsh sometimes when you meet someone you looked up for up to, and then they're a fucking dick. Um, so, which I'm sure everyone's experienced in life, um, right. <laughs> so, you know, cause you hold up some of these guys on a pedestal and then, you know, you find out what they talk about on the records are the opposite of how they are in real life. So that was a, that was a tough one. And this kind of gets uh, detailed on a Brooklyn story. Uh, Master Ace was pretty much the first uh, like known MC to give you a shot, correct? I mean, if we're talking legends, yes. If we're talking legends. But I have to shout out Pumpkinhead, rest in peace. He was the first MC that let me produce an album for him. Oh, okay, and, yeah. And we did an album called Orange Moon Over Brooklyn. And, uh, you know... He was definitely one of the first MCs to to take my beats and an unknown kid producer and, and have faith and let me do his whole record. So I have to shout him out as well. Um, and, you know, to me, Pumpkinhead's a, a, a Brooklyn legend. But if we're talking like more known in the world, Ace definitely putting me on, you know, Long Hot Summer and then doing Nostalgia for my record were, were integral parts you know nostalgia was everything for me that to me that's my introduction to really on a bigger scale the the independent underground hip-hop scene worldwide going back to this album that you did with Pumpkinhead, uh rest in peace Pumpkinhead. uh how you know how was it uh, doing that album you know this is the first time uh somebody's gonna let you do the whole album uh he was somebody that was definitely uh known in the independent hip-hop circles you know how was that time it was fucking fun as hell. I was excited, man. Like all these dudes I used to listen to back in Toronto on college radio, I'm, you know, I'm hanging around and I'm working with and, you know, um, I was still working at the cutting room. So we had the, 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 the dope access to recording of Orange Moon Over Brooklyn in the cutting room for free, you know, using a million dollar SSL and the best mics and all my engineer buddies like Dylan Marjoram and Joe Nardone were helping me mix and record it. And it was like, I basically had access to the best shit for free and he got to reap the benefits of all of that. And I'm sure for him, it was exciting as well. Cause you know, we're having, we're having sessions in a really, really dope studio that none of us could afford at full rate if we were just regular, you know, people. So I think I brought a lot to the table in that aspect. And, uh, it was exciting, man. It was really, it was an exciting time for me. I was coming up and starting to get my name out and yeah, man. It's dope. On this uh, new album, Brooklyn Story with Master Ace, like I said before, it you know it pretty much details your move to New to New York. Um, Master Ace has his own stories about uh, Brooklyn. Where did the idea t for this album and this story originally come from? Hundred percent came from Master Ace. Never in my mind would I have suggested to Ace, "Hey, dude, let's make the album about me." Like. I <laughs> That would have never happened. I'm just not that dude to, 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 I wouldn't have, you know, he, God bless him. You know, when he presented this idea, I was, I was emotionally humbled that he would, you know, want to put the focus on me. Uh, and it was amazing. And it was, you know, and I'll, I'll thank him for the rest of my life to, to tell, you know, to tell my story. I th and I thought it was really cool of him. And uh, just, a, it just shows the type of person that he is. I think that's why we get along. It's like Ace is literally 
um, there's just no egos. He's just an amazing person besides being a legendary artist. And, you know, we've become such good friends. So, yeah, that was his idea. Yeah, obviously, you know, Master Ace's albums are a story. The whole album is a story. It's like a book. All the songs are chapters. You know, how did how did he present it to you? And how did you guys break down making this into, like, a, the true story of your journey? Well, he knew about most of it. Uh, you know, just because over the years we've become friends and he, he you know, we, he remembered some of the things I probably told him and then started outlining a sketch for some of the skits and who would be on it. Um, he definitely, you know, did some things, some embellishments to make it a little bit more interesting and fit the album. And sometimes I had to be like, all right, no, my dad wouldn't have said that or <laughs> or, you know, this or that. But for the most part, man, it was pretty on point, like. You know, most of my friends, my ex-girlfriend, like Shiloh, who's on the skit, like we did do small tweaks just to make it work for what they might have said at that moment. But, you know, overall, it, it's pretty fucking close, man, to, you know, to the vibes of, of, of how everything worked out. But he he outlined it. He wrote all the skits. He was like the Tarantino of the shit when it, when it came to, you know, the vision. <laughs> what was your uh, favorite song to do on there? Uh, favorite song on the Brooklyn story? Yes. Huh. I don't have a favorite song because it's just every day my vibe changes. Like, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of amazing sh- sessions. I mean, anytime I work with Pharaoh, it's fucking mind blasting because he's insane. It's like a robot from the future when it comes to, you know, attacking concepts and writing and, and making songs. And I learned so much from him. So that was the standout session, you know, working with Lil Fame from MLP, he came through. That's my that's my G. Like um was amazing, but really, you know, it was all it was all dope. Um it all just kind of happened so fast once we started picking out the beats, we were just knocking out songs and you know, um I don't have a favorite to have to to answer that question. It changes every day. <laughs> right. Yeah, I just saw the the video for Kings that's that's kind of like a nice little trailer almost like for the album, you know. What was what was your thoughts going into uh, the the video for it? Did you have any input in that? Um, I always have my input when the video's made, but I think Alice, who did, you know, we we found out about him because he brought some of our album covers to life on Instagram. You know, he he brought my execution album with Rusty Jooks. He had it all moving around and Ace yeah. and Ace is like, "Have you seen this guy?" And I'm like, "Oh shit, I have." And so we kind of Ace. I think Ace and him formulated the idea. I don't remember exactly about taking all you know a bunch of press picks and mostly tour or show uh, flyers and and kind of just bringing them to life. So. It just came, you know, it was executed really well, and I think it's really dope. It's so hard to make a, a hip hop video or a video in general and not do something that's so played out, like just me and Ace standing around doing rap hands looking tough. Like, so, <laughs> so these type of ideas are so important to, you know, the visuals are very important these days, and, and um, I'm, I'm happy that 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 was executed so, so dopely because I think it's interesting and it's different and um, it captures so much. Yeah, these days with videos, especially like when you go into like maybe pop music or metal or rock, like sometimes I like the lyric videos that people are making more than the official videos. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it's yeah, man. Like we have songs we want to do on the album we haven't shot videos for, and we're not about just knocking out videos for the sake of it. It's like we got to figure this out because, you know people have been running certain ideas into the ground for years and and ace one thing about him that i like is he's always pushing to be different and not different for being different but different dope you know to be dope and stand out so yeah right now i'm looking at like your discography and you've had so many you've worked with so many talented hip-hop artists you know you have you know, cannabis, Talib Kweli, um, Health of Skeleton. I never work. I never work with cannabis. That's a typo. Whoever wrote that. And oh, it's so, shit. <laughs> and it, all right. This wiki sucks. Then <laughs> it, it's all good, and it's so funny and random because I literally met cannabis last night for the first time, um, and um, so it's so random that that typo led to connecting with me meeting him last night but i didn't work with cannabis yet shouts to him though they got like on on wikipedia they got like three joints that you did with him (laughs) 
Yeah, dude. Unless he unless he took beats I'm unaware of, which <laughs> these days is possible. I'm gonna have to go check that out now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. But um, but the uh, the point is that you've worked with so many different um, just people who are just you know legends of hip hop, people who've been known names for so long. You know, looking back, you know since this time you moved to uh to new york you know how does it feel to you know looking back all these people that you've been able to work with i all i can think about is the biggie lyric it was all a dream i used to read word up magazine like it's it's crazy to me you know i I, i've produced for some like literally some of the best to ever do it rock him big daddy kane scarface pharaoh munch like I don't care how many years I've had in this game because I consider myself, I'm not a, a youngster anymore. I have almost 15 years and I never stop being a fan. So to me, it's incredible. You know, I've had DJ Premier do intros on my album, do scratches on my record. <laughs> well, I've, you know, I've produced for Large Professor who's like, you know, should be on the Mount Rushmore of hip hop uh, producers. It's, it's never, I don't know. I think if I ever lose the, the, the feeling where I stop really acknowledging and caring about that, I should retire because most of this shit to me is about the respect and, and being a fan and appreciating, um, you know, the opportunity to work with the greats. So uh, it's been amazing. During your time in New York, what has the city itself instilled in you? <sighs> Never stop working is, is probably, you know, the biggest one. New York is so... New York doesn't stop. New York needs to chill the fuck out, and it never, <laughs> it never will. It, it's hustle and bustle. It's you feel the energy when you're when you're here. It's just everyone's moving and struggling to barely make it and survive and pay their bills. And you know, there's pros and cons to that. But I think for me, working in music, it's a pro because music is just it, it's gotten so hard, and even harder every year with the oversaturation and the introduction of social media. So now. Basically, anyone has a platform to be an artist, and there's no there's no filter for anything anymore. So it's harder to stand out in the crowd with your releases and your music, you know, because there's a gazillion other people doing it, and maybe they know how to use social media better. So, you know, it's actually the hustle and the bustle is more important than the actual skills these days in terms of, of, of getting your music heard. So, you know, I think uh, that's the main thing New York brought to the table. How do you feel like you stand out in like an ever changing world and ever changing music world? Being myself, um, just being regular, man, and 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 just listening to the voice inside of me that it just you know I create music that I would want to hear um, that I think is dope, um, you know, and it doesn't always happen. Sometimes the pressures of the industry have me doing some shit, and I have to stop myself. I'm like, that's not you. Just just chill the fuck out, you know, like. But, you know, I think once an artist realizes that there's only one of them in the world and that automatically can make you stand out if you channel that energy, it's the most difficult thing to do is to be comfortable with whatever creativity as crazy as you think it is. Like that's I think that's the hardest journey for an artist is to realize, hey, I don't have to like, you know, <clears throat> copy this or or do this. I could just like channel what's inside of me and that automatically makes it unique and different, you know, is is you know and i think i get better at that you know every year how do you deal with sort of those temptations to do something that you're not really that isn't truly you that the industry might pressure you to do um you know thankfully i have a very honest group of friends around me that i i kind of depend on as a buffer specifically shiloh and then skids where you know, my entire career, every piece of music I've ever made, I send to Shiloh first before the world hears it. And uh, I put a lot of trust in him in terms of, you know, him guiding me. I call him my beat Yoda, you know, and just listening. <laughs> but really what I most appreciate about him is his honesty. You know, he's not a yes man. He's there to make sure that I'm fucking owning my skills and being the best I can in all aspects and you know, he's helped me develop my sound. And now, you know, although it's always changing, he's, he keeps me on point. He's like, yo, those drums are trash. You could do better, you know. And 
I, f- I really feel like everybody needs to have somebody that like that in their life, you know, and now, you know, I don't always agree with what he says. And sometimes I'm like, nah, this is, this is how I see it. And, but I think it's just important to have people around you. Cause I've done, de- I've done some different shit that, you know, that's come out really dope. It just has to happen organically and not because, oh shit, I just watched 10 videos and they all sound like this. I need to go do some shit like that. It just really has to happen. I sit down and whatever I feel comes out. If it's different from some, you know, regular boom bappy shit I do, then that's dope. But it just has to happen because it happens. How do you, like, that sort of idea of having those, that small circle of people that will be honest with you, um, how do you feel that ha- that has sort of molded your sound? Like, wh- how do you feel like you would have been if you didn't have that good inner circle? I don't know. <clears throat> It's a fucking million dollar question. I talk about it with Shire all the time. I'm like, if you, you know, um, because we kind of got distant for a while in the beginnings of my journeys to New York. And um, and I I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I would have put out a lot of crazier shit, you know, and maybe there's a positive to that. Maybe there's a negative, but I don't know. That's like I think about it all the time, you know. Um, So. I don't know, maybe one day I just need to go to like Columbia by myself for 30 days and just make an album and not send it to anybody and put it out and just fucking put my balls on the line and see what happens, you know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when, it, when it comes to the type of hip hop that you make, um, you know, it's definitely influenced by like the Pete Rocks and the DJ Premiers. Um, it's that gritty, boom bap, you know, East Coast sound, you know, that that sound is never really, you know, it's never gone away. It's always been existed on the underground. You know, how do you feel like that sort of sound, you know, how, how do you feel like it lives these days? You know, do you feel like it's like that sound is a healthy place right now in music? It can be, man, but you know, there's a lot of generic boom bap stuff as well. So it's not like, you know, I think to me, it, it's definitely what separates the greats is is how they can take that type of energy and influence from boom bap and still make it sound current or you know fresh and new. That's what separates the men from the boys, because um, there's definitely a formula for certain types of beats. But you know, how do you do something that's literally been done over and over and over again and make it special? And like I said, that's what separates the men from the boys. And and uh, it's very fucking difficult, and I rack my brain all the time. I'm like, how do I sample drums and this whole sample and a bass line and make it sound like some new shit? Like, it's fuck. It's that's the, another million dollar question. You just gotta fucking feel it out, and uh, you know, trust your instincts. After you made this move to New York, was there a moment like that holy shit moment? Where that happened could have been someone you met, something someone said, something that happened where you realized, hey, this move might, you know, work out for me and I might be able to do this music thing for a long time. Right. It's probably when I started getting acknowledged and I started getting phone calls from MCs, you know, like that wanted beats from me or heard about me. You know, that's when it started all happening. Like, you know, I remember meeting Buckshot in L.A. and giving him a CD and and then, you know, three months later, Drew Ha calling me and like, yo, we're using like a bunch of joints on the boot camp album, Health the Skeleton. I'll never forget the day Big Daddy Kane called me on the phone, uh, shouts to Ace who made that link. And I'll never forget the first time I spoke to Scarface on the phone uh, when he used a beat of mine and he's like, yo, who do you want to work with? And I'm like, uh, f- you know, I'm like, I don't know, Busta? He's like, one second. He calls Busta on three-way. I'm on a three-way call with Scarface and Busta Rhymes. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? I don't even remember what I said. I probably sounded like an idiot. But it was, I got some crazy stories, man. But, you know, a combination of that type of energy made me think, hey, man, you might be, you know, kind of eyed at making beats. Keep doing it, kiddo. So. <laughs> Is there is there anybody that you haven't worked with yet that you'd love to work with? Hell yeah, this is still a long list, man. All, you know, a lot of the Wu Tang guys, Raekwon, Ghostface, Method Man, you know, and then to to come more into this era, you know, I would love to do shit for J Cole or Kendrick, Sir from from the TDE family, who's who's as a singer is really dope. I'd love to work with him. Um, a lot of people, man. There's still some legends, some 
OG legends I want to work with, like Slick Rick or, um, yeah, man, there's, there's a lot of people, a lot of people. Conway, who's a new kid, he's a, not a new kid, he's a Conway from Buffalo, from the Griselda crew, is yeah. really, if I want to work with him. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. When everything's all said and done, what do you hope your legacy is? <sighs> I guess I just hope that people look at my music in the same sense of somebody who was a student and helped maintain all the things about hip hop they loved and hip hop music and when they see the name Marco Polo they you know without hesitation can can feel like they trust me to provide something that brings them musical joy if even something like that man that would that would make my life you know and, and people have told me I have done that which is a blessing um but yeah man I want to I want to I want to be up there with the, with the greats uh, like DJ Premier and Pete Rock and Prince Paul and and Large Professor and the Beat Nuts and just you know one day that's what I'm working towards all the time. If there was like something, if there was a lesson that you could sort of extract from your life and career that anybody listening to this interview could take and apply it to their own life, whether they make music or do any sort of other creative endeavor, you know, what do you think that would be? Relationships. Uh, I feel like strong relationships with artists and friendships make better music uh, than two big names collaborating because they're two known names. Like, I really think that I've made my best music with people that I that trust each other in the studio and, and have a relationship and the egos get thrown to the floor and it's all about pushing each other to make the best stuff and being open to hearing criticism and fix things and not, you know, just trying to control everything. You know, I think one of the reasons me and Ace made this album so organically is because we get in the studio and allow each other the room to, to master our parts of the puzzle. Um, and sometimes as up and coming producers, you have no say because you're trying to get on. You send beats to someone. They don't even tell you if they, you, you know, you just find out one day, oh, shit, it's on the Internet. They made a song to my shit. You had no idea you weren't involved in recording it or mixing it. And these are some of the most painful. And I've had these experiences. So I really think locking in with an artist and trying to create a world together you know, will resonate with people. And I think that applies to some of the most classic albums in hip hop, you know groups like tribe and wu-tang and where it was like one producer did the whole thing and they locked in and they were all from the same place and the same vision like it's just special where i think now people are just like i have a big name you have a big name let's work together and 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 the song's like okay like did they really go in the studio and try and collab like you know the i would definitely push as any artist to to connect with somebody else and really really make something yeah, you've had a few albums where uh, you produced the whole album for an MC. You had one with Master Ace, Rusty Jux, Torre, and then the Pumpkinhead one, like we talked about. You know, when it comes down to it, like, how, how you know, what's the, the, the basic relationship that you have with these MCs when you're doing a whole album uh, for them? You know, what is the process? Um,. The process is just kind of build from the beginning about, you know, what what's the goal? What are we trying to do? Like me and Torre, when we made Double Barrel, we were just on some, let's fucking make some filthy, dirty New York, punch you in the face, hoodie Timberland music, like the good old classic sound that we felt <laughs> was, you know, and I feel like all people always feel like that sound's gone, even though it's always there. You just got to look for it. But me and Torre had something to prove. Um and so we, we just, you know, I tried to make the hardest beats I ever made in my life. And he came with the hardest rhymes ever. And, you know, that's what we did. Same thing with Rusty Jooks. Um, then there was one I did with Hannibal Stacks from Gangstar Foundation. And, you know, it was just, it's just about locking in with someone and talking and and um, and really building. And that kind of, and then you just start recording a few joints. And then you just start, you go from there and you just vibe. How is the process different? when you do your own album oh god my own albums are a nightmare it's so much work 
<laughs> it, it is because you know what it is. It's not one artist. You know, it's like fifty. You know, my producer uh, albums. It's so many people and posse cuts and as much as I love making them, I'm happy to take a break from it um, because it was very involved, man. You know, you're trying to you're trying to pull all these people into your world and get them on the same page and and pull performances from people that might not see the vision, but, you know, they want to. And, you know, it's 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 a grueling process, man. Shouts to all the producers that that literally <laughs> break their backs trying to make a producer album. So <laughs> it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work for for little payoff besides just being content that you made something that you're happy with. But yeah, it's tough. Producer albums are tough. I'm kind of glad that I probably never do one again, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I, I can only imagine. Mm-hmm. So what's the future have in, whole, uh, have in store for you? Um, well, right now it's all about Master East and Marco Polo, man. We're, we're, we're trying to bring this album all around the world and perform in literally every continent. So I haven't really thought past that at this point. Uh, I do have a, a new project started with Torre. We're going to do a follow-up to our album, and we've recorded some material, but we definitely have to lock in, and it's just going to have to happen when when the time is right. Um, but right now, it's all about a Brooklyn story and taking that energy. Um, but on a side note, if you're asking me what, I, what I'd like to do in the future, one of the main things right now, to be honest, is I want to score a film. I want to do the music for... You know, I want someone to give me a film and let me make the music for the whole fucking thing. That's what I want to do, man, because I've always wanted to do it. And I think I make a lot of different type of ambient, weird, emotional stuff that might not necessarily work for someone to rhyme on, but would be dope in uh, bringing life to a, you know, a, a television screen or a movie screen. Well, I hope that happens for you. Um, yeah. Um. I always like to end my uh, interviews for the, uh, on this podcast with the same question. And the question is, who is somebody that's been a part of your life or career that I could realistically interview for this podcast and they would have some good stories or lessons to talk about? Shiloh, number one. I can make it happen. <laughs> Shiloh. <laughs> Isn't he? Yeah, Shiloh is, is the person who taught me how to make beats. Um, so he's... He's like my beat Yoda, like I said, but he's also my cl- one of my closest friends. Uh, we, we just started a production crew, me, Shiloh, and DJ Skiz called The Drum Majors, and he's literally been there from the beginning, a part of every album I've ever done. Um, nobody knows my journey and my music catalog more than him. So if that's actually something you're interested in, in, in talking to him, I will make it happen. Word. Good good choice. Good choice. All right, before we get out of here, uh, if anybody wants to uh, get more information about what you're doing, about a Brooklyn story, where can they go online? Um, my social media is Marco Polo Beats on Twitter, Marco Polo Beats on Instagram, on Facebook, it's Marco Polo Beats PA. Uh, my website, MarcoPoloBeats.com for all my drum kits for all you up and coming producers. Um for our Brooklyn story, you can go to fatbeats.com and buy the vinyl, the CD. Uh, it's all available on all digital platforms, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Tidal, everything. So um, it's all out there, and all my older releases are all over the place. So, yeah, I'm, I'm an easy guy to find on the Internet. Nice, nice. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time out to chat with me. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So that was my interview with Marco Polo. A link to stream or purchase A Brooklyn Story is in the show notes at freshisthepodcast.com for this episode, along with links to follow Marco Polo online. So, all right, that was another episode in the books. Thank you for listening. Goodbye and good night. Fresh is the word.